Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode of A Golden Path to Spring One. Um, if you haven't been here before, welcome. Thanks for joining. And if you have, thanks for coming back. Again, we're doing this every Tuesday and Thursday up until later in August when we have Spring One, which is co-located this time around uh, with VMware Explore in Vegas. But there'll be a little graphic at the end of this to tell you a little bit more, or you could go look it up online. So yeah, uh, today we have Christian. And apparently in the US, we only call people by their first name. <laughs> but yeah, uh, welcome to today's stream. Thanks for the introduction. And yeah, I guess we can get started. Do you? Yeah, sounds show? good. Yeah, so today's episode is about uh, Growl VM native images. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will ask them throughout and we'll get some answers for that. And yeah, I'm super excited to see this because Josh was showing me Gravity on the first time like a year ago and I started playing around with it and we were doing things with uh, Kubernetes operators and Gravity on, but yeah, I'll let you go ahead and start. Yeah, let's get started here. Thanks everyone uh, for joining. I'm very excited to tell you today about uh, Gravity and native image and how uh, to work, how it works together uh, with uh, Spring framework. So we'll look quite a good bit into uh, source code and run through some uh, uh, short uh, demos. But first, a uh, little introduction who I am. I have been working on Java virtual machines for uh, about 20 years now. Uh, first on the Java hotspot VM, uh, on uh, the just-in-time compilers. Then I did a little detour into uh, the security side of uh, compilers and virtual machines but I decided that uh, performance is somehow more interesting uh, than the security aspect, although we'll talk a little bit about security uh, today too. And for the last decade, uh, a little longer, I have been uh, leading the GraalVM native image uh, uh, efforts at Oracle. And actually I, I wrote the first commit uh, of GraalVM native image. So I think here is about everything that you can uh, see in native image right now. Uh, you can kind of uh, blame me uh, for it. But uh, GraalVM is actually uh, quite a good bit more uh, than just a native image. So uh, actually GraalVM are uh, three different things. It's uh, at first, it's just a new uh, just-in-time compiler for the Java hotspot VM. And it's like uh, you plug in uh, GraalVM and when you download it, and uh, then your Java application on the hotspot VM runs faster without you doing really much of anything. But then, of course, from my point of view, the most interesting thing and the focus of this talk is the native image uh, generator, where you uh, take your Java application and you convert it to a standalone uh, a binary that starts fast, has a lower memory footprint, uh, and better security uh, uh, guarantees. So that's what we are going to talk about uh, today. But I still want to mention that GraalVM is also a large multi-language support framework. We have uh, JavaScript, we have Ruby, we have Python, WebAssembly, all sorts of different languages implemented in a GraalVM. So when you kind of want to integrate scripting support into your Java application, you can use it. But also if you're interested in kind of standalone JavaScript or Python execution, that will, is also a quite a useful uh, project. But for today, as I said, I will talk exclusively about this middle part of uh, the slide ahead of time, native image uh, generation that we have in GraalVM. Mm -hmm. GraalVM is a very large open source project. Uh, actually, in uh, about uh, more than 3.6 million lines of code of uh, open source code that Oracle maintains as part of GraalVM. It's like all of the main development of uh, effort is open source. So you can kind of follow us also on uh, the development level if you're interested. So we have everything on GitHub. We have our development roadmap on GitHub. We have our issue tracker on GitHub. Uh, but then uh, it's uh, not just open, an open source project. It is also kind of a supported Oracle product. So based on this open source code, Oracle uh, releases a uh, a fully supported uh, product where you get all uh, of the usual Oracle support guarantees when you have uh, a 
Java SE subscription, uh, then you get that already out of the box. When you run on the Oracle Cloud, you get that uh, out of the box. You get kind of a fully supported, fully maintained uh, Oracle product that is based on all of the open source uh, source code. Why are we doing that? That's a very interesting question because it's like uh, for uh, the longest time, kind of the uh, Java server ecosystem was quite settled. You had your Java uh, enterprise uh, uh, web uh, edition and you had kind of uh, the large uh, monolithic uh, uh, enterprise servers. And that worked actually quite well uh, with the Java hotspot VM and uh, one large server and you deployed your application there. But then uh, the cloud and the microservices uh, uh, entered the world and now it changed how software is written. It's like it's no longer a monolithic application. It's like smaller services that you want to deploy and, uh, and run independently. And also new programming language, languages uh, came. Uh, languages like Go uh, challenged the position of Java with uh, uh, propositions like uh, lower memory footprint, uh, faster startup time. Node.js uh, has a very interesting programming model, uh, like also taking away, uh, away uh, shares, um, market share from Java. And so we need to kind of react to that. And so in our, from our point of view, Java needs to be, and also can be better than Go uh, for application startup and memory footprint. And uh, of course you should never uh, believe me as from Oracle when saying that, but it's like also other people uh, say that, uh, I well, have one quote from uh, from Microsoft developer uh, developer advocate Bruno Burgess, who also tweeted like, "Yeah, if you uh, before thinking about going to uh, go uh, for your service, well, uh, Java and native image uh, can actually uh, give you that without uh, leaving uh, the Java ecosystem. And the Java ecosystem is actually uh, a very big and very important uh, thing because it's like." There are tons and tons of libraries for about everything out there that's already uh, available uh, uh, on Maven uh, and you can just use. And of course, you want to keep using all of your libraries and all of your dependencies. So when we run now Java in the cloud uh, as microservices, what are our goals? And these are the points that we go through uh, in my presentation today. First, of course, you want to start fast because when you deploy and run microservices quite frequently, uh, then uh, uh, minutes of startup time, even seconds of startup time are no longer acceptable. You really need to start within uh, a few milliseconds so that when you uh, scale up your application, you have a spike in load. You really want to kind of uh, scale up your microservice uh, immediately. And then uh, low resource usage, usage, because if you start many services, you want to share as much as possible between the services and uh, make sure that every service has the minimum amount of resource usage. Security is very important uh, these days. Uh, there are lots of uh, vulnerabilities uh, in Java that uh, pop up. It's like, and many of them are uh, based on the fact that it's like, yeah, Java is very dynamic and sudden, uh, sometimes uh, you, uh, attackers can exploit to run code that you didn't even know was there and didn't even know uh, that could run. And when you uh, deploy uh, on something like Docker containers, then also compact packaging is uh, quite important. But in the end, uh, all of uh, these microservice efforts are only successful and Java uh, in microservices only works because there is a large ecosystem and uh, a large amount number of frameworks that you can uh, base your code on. There's of course uh, Spring, which will be the focus of uh, today, but there are also other frameworks like Micronaut, like Quarkus and like Helidon. And they all uh, come with out of the box support uh, for GraalVM uh, native image. So it's like if you use any of these frameworks uh, then it's very easy and uh, to use uh, uh, GraalVM native image already, which is very important for us because it's like if you really start from scratch and kind of have a uh, empty application and then want to add in everything yourself, uh, then uh, it would be quite complicated because as we will discuss later today, it's like reflection is a bit of a complication. You need to configure everything properly so that you have the reflection configuration, resources are properly configured. And uh, the good news is that all of these microservice frameworks 
are kind of uh, doing that for you uh, for most of the cases. So there's very little that you actually as an application developer uh, need to do. So yeah, let's get started with our uh, demo application. And the easiest way uh, to start uh, a demo application is of course, uh, you, if you want to start with Spring, you go to the Spring uh, Initializer project, uh, start.spring.io. And uh, we click together uh, our little demo application where we actually don't want to do much. Uh, what we need to do is we need to add uh, uh, GraalVM native support because obviously we want to demo that. And we are building just a, a simple uh, a Spring uh, web application, nothing uh, in particular. And then what you get is already a, a properly uh, pre-configured uh, project, either for Gradle or uh, for Maven. Actually, I'm going to use Maven, but it's like uh, with Gradle, it's also all your dependencies are automatically there. So it's like the important thing uh, for native image support is like when you use Gradle, that the uh, or GraalVM build tools.native uh, line is there as a plugin, which uh, configures all the native support for Spring when you use Gradle. And uh, when you use uh, Maven, and then you also need to make sure that in your pom.xml, uh, the, uh, the work GraalVM build tools uh, native Maven plugin is there. And as soon as you have that set up uh, in your project, uh, then uh, many things uh, just are there automatically. To get started a little uh, quicker, I already have that uh, now loaded uh, in my uh, IntelliJ. And uh, the only thing I added to this demo application that got created is like the usual spring uh, greeting service. It also copied from the internet. So it's like we have a uh, response that we want to send out uh, with an ID and a content. And in our uh, greeting service, uh, we just uh, yeah we react to the uh, to the greeting uh, URL with uh, no, uh, uh, an ID and just uh, the usual hello world uh, template. Yeah, so not overly much uh, in there. One thing that I also added, which is very convenient uh, during development, is like. You don't really want to have the uh, full performance uh, of uh, your native image during development. You really want a fast build time. And we have a very nice uh, a quick build mode uh, that I have enabled. So I have in, in my build tools plugin in the configuration section, I have added the build arc minus OB, which means we optimize uh, everything that we build right now for build time, which makes uh, the applications larger and the startup a little, little slower, just a tiny bit. Uh, but it uh, is better uh, because our turnaround time during development uh, are quicker. And now uh, building all of that uh, is uh, very easy because uh, everything comes out of the box uh, with the native build tool support. So in my uh, Maven, I only need to call uh, uh, Maven with the minus P native uh, option, and then I can do a native compile, which builds uh, a native image. And uh, while that is running, I can tell you a little bit uh, what is going on. So first, what's going on is like, that's the normal uh, spring uh, build process. And with the uh, 3.0 uh, release of, uh, of Spring Boot, uh, there was uh, also a kind of an extension uh, to uh, how Spring builds applications because Spring also now kind of runs code already uh, that you, you wrote also at build time to kind of make them uh, the startup faster, which is not uh, directly related to native image, but it's kind of uh, the same uh, approach and inspired by what we uh, uh, started with native images. Like you want to do as much as possible uh, uh, at uh, build time already. So there we will later see how actually a code from us will also run uh, at that time. And then eventually uh, Spring uh, invokes uh, our native image tool. And uh, that's then the tool that really converts your Spring application into a single uh, self-contained uh, binary. And as part of that, it's like we now have uh, 
on our class pass, all of our uh, Spring application with all of its dependencies. And now uh, the native image tool is running a quite aggressive static analysis on this code to find out what really uh, of this code uh, is reachable. It's like on a very fine grained per field, per method uh, level, uh, we find out is this method necessary or is this method uh, not necessary. And, uh, and then after the static analysis, it found out for our application, actually about 80,000 methods were uh, found as reachable. And they, these methods then uh, got compiled uh, to machine code and everything got linked together. So what I have uh, now in my uh, application uh, in, uh, after this build is uh, I got a demo executable and uh, that's all that you need uh, to run your application. So it's like there's no more uh, dependency on a full JDK. There's no dependency on the Java hotspot VM. Everything that you need is included in this one uh, binary. Mm. And so that's the thing you need to uh, distribute or put in your Docker container. And uh, that's the thing uh, we can run. And mm. we start that. Uh, then you see, like, oh, we started up uh, our uh, full uh, spring application now in uh, 48 uh, milliseconds. And that's with all the overhead that I have on my laptop while all the video encoding and whatever is running. Mm. Yeah, so the, uh, the question in the chat, uh, is the native image built on the architecture that your machine is running on? Yes. So that is kind of one of the limitations. It's like you uh, run the native image generator on uh, an operating system uh, that you built the image for. Uh, but luckily, uh, there are uh, all uh, the cloud-based build tools. So there are, for example, GitHub Actions. So it's like on GitHub, you can define a GitHub Action. And then uh, using that, you can actually build your native images uh, for Linux, for Windows, for Mac OS uh, on dedicated Linux and Windows and Mac OS systems as part uh, of, a, uh, of your build system. And yes, the application is uh, working. There is not uh, much going on in this application. It's just when I send a greeting request, it responds with uh, hello uh, and the name uh, that I uh, provide. Yeah, and someone was asking um, if they could, uh, let me pull it up. There's a few different things. Um, they're wondering if they can use this native image within a Docker Compose container with dependencies. Uh, yes, you can do that, but the good thing is uh, that you don't really need much in terms of dependencies. So the image that I have built now uh, still kind of has a dynamic link uh, time dependencies on uh, the standard C library and a few other libraries like uh, libzip. But we also have a mode where you can uh, build uh, a native image that it really only depends on libc. So then that way you can run it in a Docker container that really uh, is very bare metal and only has uh, your C library installed. And finally, we have a mode where actually where we also link in the muscle C library statically. And that way you can run a native image in a completely empty uh, Docker container too. So then if you build an image like that, then you have uh, the, the complete C library and all other dependencies that you might depend on uh, statically linked into a single binary and you really run in a, a Docker, in a Scratch container that contains nothing but uh, this single binary. All right. And then the next one is, is the native image built on the architecture that your machine is running on? And if so, can I somehow build an ARM64 image on my Windows machine? Uh -huh. The, for the operating system, uh, the requirement is, is quite strict that you need to be on the operating system that you build on because the JDK is so different on every operating system. For architecture, there is a limited way of how you can do cross compile. So it's possible to do a cross compilation on Linux, AMD64 to build a Linux uh, ARM image or on Windows, AMD64 to build a Windows uh, ARM image although Windows ARM is kind of very, very preliminary because there's not much there. But yes, you can do uh, a little bit of architecture cross-compile, but the easiest and the best way is it's like you build 
on the machine where you actually want to deploy it, then everything works nicely out of the box. And I think that was a bigger problem in the past, but now with all these cloud-based build services, it's very easy to kind of uh, get, because it's like when you build it, you really want to test it anyways on that architecture and that platform too. And it's like for testing, obviously, uh, you need really uh, a system where you can then execute the code. Cool. Thanks. So yeah, we kind of uh, built our first uh, native image here. Uh, what do we uh, get? I already told you all of that. Uh, while the image build was running, we take all of our application code, all of the library code, all of the JDK code, and uh, interestingly, also uh, our complete virtual, virtual machine code. So like even the garbage collector, all of that uh, goes into our native executable. Mm. What does that give us? That gives us very predictable performance. Uh, because it's like if you run an application on the Java hotspot VM, uh, then uh, with a JIT compiler, then there's a lot that actually goes on uh, at startup time. You need to load your char files from disk, uncompress that, verify the class files. But then the real slowdown is that you start executing everything in the interpreter, which is about 20 times uh, uh, slower than a compiled code, just to find out uh, that your application is always doing the same during startup, and then you compile always the same method. And finally, after some time, you really run at peak performance. And then when the a virtual machine uh, it sees something unexpected that was not seen during profiling, then it de-optimizes again and it goes back uh, to the interpreter and then suddenly your application it runs 20 times uh, slower again. Versus with a native image, you really uh, you load your executable from disk and you start executing at peak performance and uh, then uh, you, you never regress uh, from that uh, peak performance. Mm. So that's uh, what I mean by predictable performance. It's like there's no de-optimization. You never kind of uh, go back to a slower mode. And also, uh, it allows us to kind of do quite aggressive optimizations that are much more difficult to do in a dynamic setting like the hotspot VM. So it's like uh, interface calls, for example. You can always kind of construct examples where you have a complex interface hierarchy and you run it on the hotspot VM. And suddenly, a type check or an interface call is really an order of magnitude slower than it used to be because the caching mechanisms of the hotspot VM fails. Versus when you run at the native image, then uh, an interface call or a uh, dynamic type check is always simple. It's always constant time because we know exactly uh, what code uh, can run and we can uh, always optimize and uh, generate the best possible code for the code that you have. And we do much larger aggressive transformations too. It's like, for example, we can do outlining of allocations of string concatenation. One interesting thing is like, for example, string.format, it's like, well, uh, yes, you can do a string.format where also your format string it itself is kind of uh, not constant, but in most cases it is constant. So what we just do is like, well, we pre-pass the format string at build time, and that way you save the format string passing at, uh, at runtime. So it's like for certain string format operations, it's like when you run them as a native image, they're much faster because uh, you save all the uh, time that's necessary uh, for uh, the format string passing. And it's like, uh, even in the simple demo application that I uh, downloaded uh, from the internet, it's like uh, the greeting application is like, you know, it's doing a string.format. And it's doing the string.format with a constant template because it's coming from a static final field and it's only a simple percent %s modifier. So in that case, what actually gets compiled here in your native image is not a call to string.format, but it's like invoke a string formatting with already a pre pass template that just needs to append hello and uh, the name that you pass in. So that is a, it's just an example of uh, the aggressive optimizations that you can do uh, easily uh, when you have uh, everything available at build time and you can uh, compile and optimize everything uh, together. Low resource usage is, of course, also necessary for the cloud. And the problem with uh, run, running on the hotspot VM with JIT compilation, it's like, yes, the 
Java hotspot VM itself and uh, the machine code like for the garbage collector is kind of uh, the same everywhere. But then you have lots of overhead also on the memory side. Uh, you do just-in-time compilation and the, the, this code needs uh, space. Uh, the profiling information needs space. So it's like there's a lot of uh, additional memory usage uh, that is not kind of in your Java heap uh, that is also consumed uh, by the uh, Java hotspot VM. Versus on our AOT side, it's like it really is a kind of the application payload and there's nothing else dynamically allocated at runtime. And that really pays off when you start the same application uh, many times, because what uh, on the JIT side, uh, a lot of things are duplicated versus on the uh, native image side, only your real application payload uh, is duplicated. And you see that, for example, when you run uh, a small service, like, uh, sorry, that was one slide uh, far. When you run a small service, like uh, we use Apache Ticker as, uh, as a benchmark here, with a very tiny configuration where we say it's like, oh, we want kind of a, a, a maximum heap size of 128 megabyte on only one CPU uh, per core and per process. And then you want to do horizontal scaling of this service and you start it uh, many times. And on hotspot, it's like, of course, even with one process, uh, it's already uh, much more uh, memory that you need to even start one uh, hotspot VM. But then it also increases much more. So when you run start four services, you have about four times the memory. Versus uh, with a native image of these uh, 60 megabytes, a lot is actually shared uh, because all your EOT compiled machine code is shared and a lot of the initial memory that's uh, allocated, uh, that's also part of the application. So your initial Java heap is also shared. And so uh, when you go to four processes, you don't need four times as much as memory, you actually only have uh, two times as much uh, memory. So you have a much better uh, scaling in terms of uh, memory usage. And you can, that means you can run uh, your application in a smaller uh, 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 cloud instance that has uh, less physical memory, which these days really save you money because memory in the cloud is kind of even more expensive uh, than a compute. In terms on the security side, uh, it's also uh, very good when you kind of uh, do the static analysis because it's like we know exactly what goes in your uh, binary and everything that this static analysis did not see uh, is now really not in your binary, so it cannot execute. It's not, there is no way to kind of load new code that was not seen at build time. So we have a, a, a mode uh, to produce an SBOM, so a software bill of material that at build time gives you a complete inventory of uh, these uh, libraries with these methods. And that's all kind of included in my application. And as long as you validate with your security scanner that uh, these things don't have a known security vulnerability, uh, then uh, you know you are good. And if a new vulnerability comes up, then you can check your existing uh, applications uh, against that and say, and even if uh, a new vulnerability comes up in a library that you depend on, but it's, you know it's in a method that the static analysis did not see as reachable, you know that uh, this vulnerability does not affect you in production because you know that this method, even though it is problematic, cannot run at runtime because it is really not included uh, in your binary. Mm. But yeah, let's go back uh, to our application and uh, extend it uh, a little more because uh, all of these uh, benefits of native image are good, but of course there's always a, a little bit of a catch. So it's like, what is not as easy when you run as a native image? And the one thing that's a little bit more complicated is uh, reflection. So, uh, and Java right reflection you did, I wanted, kind of. Uh, sorry, right before you did, I wanted to throw in one more question because I didn't yep. realize there was a comment and a question. Um, so they're wondering how you can integrate the binary from earlier into a, into Docker with having a Docker file since usually they have the jar name. Uh, well, in Docker, you kind of when you build your Docker container, you say what's uh, what's going what's going on in the Docker. So it's like in your Docker configuration, you already say only uh, this binary which means it's like you're no longer running on a Docker container that kind of uh, has a JDK as the base. And uh, then uh, you just add your char file in, you really create uh, 
a Docker file where instead of the where you instead of putting a char file in, you put your binary in. So it's like you just replace your Docker configuration. You uh, strip out uh, the JDK you, and you replace the dot char with uh, this binary that comes out. And then only that binary is in the Docker container. And yeah, you no longer, you definitely no longer need any char files of your application in the Docker container. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, let's uh, use reflection a little bit. Of course, you should not use Java reflection anyway. So it's like the code that I'm using here as a demo is like, I hope that uh, no one uh, kind of really writes code like that. But uh, for the sake of the demo, it's like I said, oh, now I kind of want to have kind of a few built in uh, repron replies uh, in my application. And uh, that means uh, I have, I need to uh, invoke that reflectively and have the code prepared for my controller application. And I really just say it's like, oh, if this name is kind of a name of my built in function, then I want to reflectively invoke that one. So not the most uh, useful example, but it definitely uses reflection. And when, uh, when you build now a native image out of that, uh, it will behave differently from when you run on the Java hotspot VM. Because if you run on the Java hotspot VM, uh, and we can uh, do that uh, uh, too, it's like, uh, there's my command line for running on on the hotspot VM, uh, which is already doing a little bit more than just running on hotspot. First, I need to uh, at least compile our code, of course, so that I run with the new version. And then I run uh, my application on the Java hotspot VM, so just with minus char. And uh, when I do that, and then, of course, I can now uh, invoke uh, this application with kind of the time command. And it gives me this built-in function that actually returns the current time in milliseconds. When you run uh, uh, just as a native image, you would not get that behavior because of what native image says is like, oh, uh, I see a reflective call, but uh, this method uh, in the built-ins class is not automatically included because we cannot kind of include all possible reflectively invoked methods because in Java, you don't know what that would be. Every method could potentially be invoked uh, via reflection. So we need to configure something manually. So we need to now tell at image build time, uh, the image builder that uh, please include uh, this one method that I really want to have reflectively available for reflection. So you need to write a reflection configuration file. Uh, of course, you don't want to do that from scratch. So what I already sneaked in uh, into my uh, command line here is like running on the Java hotspot VM with our reflection tracing agent, which kind of records all the reflection that happens uh, at uh, uh, execution time on the Java hotspot VM and already gives you kind of a template of a reflection configuration file uh, where I can uh, uh, kind of copy and paste uh, now from. And, and what, uh, I have a question. Yes. Too, sorry. Um, they're wondering how can I monitor the app without JMX? I will talk about monitoring later. So we can defer that cool. uh, question to later. Uh, what we got out of the reflection configuration is uh, oh, uh, it's still running. I also need to kind of uh, quit my application now. And now I got uh, the uh, reflection configuration file that's coming out of the tracing agent. And you see, it's like, oh, there was a lot of reflection going on in Spring uh, as part of uh, running on the hotspot VM. And luckily, you don't need to worry about that because that's all what already Spring uh, pre-configures for you. So you don't need to do anything for that. So we just need to say it's like, oh, what uh, what did we trace uh, regarding our uh, built-in class? And you see, for the built-ins class, uh, the time method uh, got uh, invoked uh, via reflection. And so all I need to do is like uh, copy and paste that and now add a reflection configuration file that is really automatically picked up 
as a part of the image build, which uh, happens uh, automatically if you put it into a meter in native image directory. So it's like there's an automatic mechanism, everything that is uh, behind uh, um, inside of a meter in native image directory. And then you can use whatever other subdirectories you want. Everything you have there is automatically uh, included into the native image. So I only need to make a new file uh, that's named reflectconfig.json uh, and uh, copy in uh, my uh, uh, built-ins declaration. And uh, now I need to rebuild my image. And then hopefully uh, reflection uh, also works from that. Uh, for that, I need to do the native compile. So we need to wait a minute now again. And uh, then uh, that should also work uh, on the native image side. One thing you might notice uh, here, uh, while, yeah, is there another question? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a thread. So, um, so you run a typical execution and collect reflections statistics, but that means you could optimize things away that happen to be part of the run is the question. And then they mentioned just deprecate the entire reflection API, I suppose. But yes, yeah, I would love to, to deprecate the reflection API, <laughs> but it's like, uh, so now we need to run real world applications and uh, real world applications use reflection. But it's like reducing reflection is definitely the best strategy to kind of uh, make sure that uh, everything really works out of the box. Uh, but then, yes, it's like if you have an application where you rely on reflection, uh, then the, uh, the best uh, way to do that is, is like uh, when you run your unit tests, you run with the tracing agent that kind of gives you an, uh, an, a good, very good overview of where is your application using reflection. And then based on that, you build your reflection configuration file of all the things that you really want to have available for reflection at image runtime. And... I really uh, uh, use this example kind of uh, on purpose that I just uh, uh, registered the time method here. So what we will see is like, even though I have uh, the time method register for reflection, so I can then effectively invoke this one, but I cannot reflectively invoke the VM method yet because it's like I explicitly did not list uh, this method as being available for reflection. And again, it's like, uh, from some point of view, it makes your life a little more difficult because it's like you need, if you want this other method, you need to configure it too. But from a security point of view, it is a real win because it's like uh, also for reflectively invoked stuff, you, all, you know that uh, reflection can only reach code uh, that you explicitly registered for reflection. So it's no longer possible that someone exploits a vulnerability uh, that then via reflection kind of invokes uh, code that's that should not be invoked by reflection, like an internal from the JDK or an internal uh, of your application. So let's see how our build is doing. It has finished. So we can start our uh, demo application again. And uh, if we go to our browser now also when running as a native image it uh, properly uh, responds to the time command but to prove that really the vm command is not in here so that part is not yet in uh, your native image it's like the other method vm is not uh, available via reflection and then there's another question um isn't derived methods difficult to eliminate as well as you might not have direct calls to it, but in effect, they might never be called? Uh, yes, uh, static analysis is a, it's a very difficult topic because it's like, uh, in the end, uh, static analysis is always a little bit conservative in the sense it's like, even if you don't have a direct call to it, the static analysis includes everything that can possibly be invoked which means uh, there are cases, of course, where it's like the static analysis needs to be conservative because it's like even, even though you as a programmer would easily see that it's like, oh, this path is not feasible, the static analysis still sees the path as feasible. So it's like sometimes you do kind of the opposite of reflection configuration and you really want to kind of configure your application uh, and uh, write your application in a style so that you actually 
help the static analysis so that it actually cuts out parts of your application that you do not want uh, reachable and you don't want uh, uh, to, to add. Uh, and, and then the, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I keep putting you off, I'm so bad at this. Yeah, that's an, uh, uh, very easy to answer question because we have the statistics here in our log. It's like for the full native image build time uh, actually has a little bit of setup. And then for our Hello World, we spent uh, 45 seconds in the static analysis. Uh, this time is like that's not affected by the quick build mode. So it's like even if you turn off the quick build mode, that will remain uh, the same. And then we spent about 20 seconds uh, compiling. And if you turn off the quick build mode, this time will go up because then we apply more optimizations, but this time uh, will uh, remain the same. So it's like for our application, it's a static analysis is 45 seconds of build time. Mm. So what else can you do uh, with reflection if you don't want to kind of write uh, manual uh, reflection configurations as JSON files? The first thing is uh, you can kind of not do reflection. That uh, would be the preferred thing. Uh, but also uh, for uh, for Spring, uh, Spring developers uh, put in a, a mechanism so that you can actually uh, run uh, code already at build time of the Spring framework uh, that then does reflection uh, configuration for you. So it's, instead of doing a kind of a JSON file, uh, that you do, you can also do this thing as source code. So for example, you can uh, write a, a Spring, uh, uh, a class that implements the Spring runtime hints registrar, where you say, oh, please from a built-ins class, and in this case, I say, uh, re register all methods uh, of this built-in class uh, for reflection. And then uh, in uh, my uh, greeting service, uh, in my greeting controller, I can, I say, well, run uh, this registrar. So it's like as soon as my uh, greeting controller uh, is uh, is reachable and is used, uh, then uh, that's kind of the programmatic reflection declaration that uh, this uh, uh, this service uh, needs. And as I said, it's like, ah, oh, it's interesting when, uh, which time uh, does the code run? So if we now uh, build our uh, Native image again and, and run the uh, spring build process. Then you see, I deliberately put this message in my registrar. This code runs at build time. So now you wrote code uh, in your spring application uh, in this registrar, and uh, the system out print line happens at build time because that's exactly what you want. You want to execute this code at build time and uh, then this reflection registration happens at build time so that uh, when the native image is then uh, uh, generated, uh, the reflection configuration is properly uh, there. That means when you uh, switch to this native image model, and that's something that we really pioneered, is like uh, you really do application initialization at build time and you run arbitrary user code also at build time. And running code at build time means it's like everything that you do at build time, you don't need to do at runtime. So that's a very powerful model, but I don't have time to go into uh, more details of that. But it's like, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can, for example, uh, preload uh, machine learning models uh, at build time so that when you start up your application, you already have a completely pre-populated machine learning model in your Java heap um, that you don't need to load. So it's like then your Java application starts up immediately and without loading anything from a file, without doing any decoding, it already has kind of this full model uh, 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 loaded. And then I also have some more stuff. Um, so um, most of us are building 1% code that we add on 99% of code we get from dependencies we download from Maven. So it seems I can't really optimize these libraries for static analysis or will libraries become more static analysis aware over time? Yeah, a perfect timing for this question uh, because uh, what we started and what kind of uh, the Spring people and also the Micronaut people uh, uh, really embraced and are contributing to is this GraalVM reachability metadata repository. So that's a community repository where kind of everyone uh, commits a necessary configuration file. So it's like there's already a long list of uh, 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 
libraries there where uh, if I just click at the random one, I hope I find something in the metadata. So it's like, oh, not like JSON web token. I have no idea what that is. Uh, but for version 11.5, uh, you need this reflection configuration file. And that's committed uh, in this metadata repository. And it's very easy to uh, use this metadata repository because you know, all you need to do is in your uh, uh, Maven or a Gradle configuration. So in our case, in uh, the POM uh, XML, uh, is it? Uh, you need to say in our uh, native image uh, build plugin, uh, I think you need to put it at this place. Or, hmm, was it wrong here? Yeah. yeah, I think it, that's the right place. But don't, no, it's not allowed here. Somewhere uh, in the pom.xml, you need to say metadata repository is enabled. And uh, then uh, it automatically takes uh, uh, the metadata from this repository uh, for all the libraries that have it registered. So it's like you only say enable the metadata repository and then all these libraries uh, that are there uh, that are here work out of the box. And uh, this list is kind of nicely uh, formatted uh, on uh, the GraalVM homepage. So it's like there's this list of libraries uh, where uh, at least it's like, oh, what's the supported level? And uh, there are two different levels. The one thing is like, well, it's really uh, tested by uh, the owners of that library. So that's the best case. It's like, oh, for these things, like obviously the Oracle JDBC driver, Oracle tests uh, that it works well with native image. And for other things, it's like it's community tested that for this library, uh, someone at least tried it and if necessary, uh, added the necessary uh, reflection uh, metadata registrations. Yeah, there's one thing uh, that was already the question uh, regarding monitoring. Uh, and, uh, so uh, while we still have a few minutes of time, we can actually, uh, I can demo you that. So let's remove that again. Uh, on the monitoring side, and in general for a lot of diagnostic things, it's like if you don't kind of want to put things into a native image uh, without telling you, uh, because it's like uh, when you have a little command line application that you want to deploy, it's like, well, you don't want Java Flight Recorder support in, in, uh, in that or JMX support or uh, JVM stat support, because it's like uh, it shouldn't be really that you deploy a command line tool and then it shows up in, uh, in some monitoring system that monitors all Java applications. So instead, what we do, all of these monitoring options are opt in. And when you build the image, build, uh, uh, then uh, you say what you want. So I can say, for example, uh, in my image, I want to enable monitoring, and I want to enable JVM stat, and I want to enable uh, heap dumping. Also, what I do just to show you is like now I'm switching the garbage collector that's get into the uh, image. So it's like instead of using our very simple uh, serial garbage collector that is very good for small heaps. I now switch to the G1 garbage collector, which is very good for medium-sized heaps up to uh, a couple uh, of gigabytes. So now uh, I can uh, rebuild uh, my image. And uh, what we build now is an image that has JVM stat support built in, which means that monitoring tools that kind of look for this kind of information will automatically see your service. And the same way there is a uh, in the upcoming release, uh, and that's actually only merged for the upcoming 23.0 release, there's a support for a GMX uh, that you can enable via the monitoring, which does not work uh, here yet because I'm based on the last release uh, 22.3 from, uh, from the last year. And uh, there's also a very a growing support uh, for Java Flight Recorder. So it's like with the upcoming uh, release, you can actually enable Java Flight Recorder too and then do things like sampling-based profiling uh, in GFR, all of that uh, like you're used to uh, from uh, the Java uh, hotspot VM. So yeah, now uh, yeah, static analysis uh, is still running. 
so I can uh, give that a minute. But yes, uh, to come back to the topic on uh, the garbage collector. So as I said, now we kind of uh, put in uh, the uh, G1 garbage collector uh, in our image. So actually now uh, kind of we can deploy our service uh, on for longer learning applications that have many threads up to a couple of gigabytes heaps. Well, G1, it works actually up to usually tens of uh, gigabytes. But if you have more, uh, then uh, you don't really have a microservice uh, anywhere. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, we're already nearly done compiling the methods. And while all that's and compiling, I might as well throw in some questions. The whole thing then really works. So what we have is like we have I have J Visual VM running, and we haven't started our service yet. So the only thing you see is like well, Visual VM itself and uh, my IntelliJ that's running. Now when I start my demo application. Then my demo application shows up uh, in JVisual VM because that's just using the uh, JVM stat uh, mechanism. It tells you, of course, well, we are running uh, on Substrate VM and not on the Hotspot VM. So Substrate VM is the internal name for the very limited runtime system that we put into every native image. Uh, and uh, we can monitor it. So it's like yeah, you see uh, the current heap usage. Uh, number of threads started so your usual kind of monitoring uh, that you want to see and since we put in a heap dump support you can also uh, ask uh, JVisual VM well please give me a heap dump uh, from my application and then you see the heap dump one interesting thing I want to mention here is like well it looks like a pretty heap, big heap dump for an application that did not do anything yet but all of these objects that you actually see here or most of these objects are objects that got allocated when building the application. So the way a native image works is like when you build, uh, we already kind of pre-allocate a lot of data structures and uh, so that we don't need to do the allocation at runtime. So actually you start your application already kind of with a, about a 20 megabyte Java heap uh, that was built at build time and there's no uh, allocation overhead. It is just there and it is shared when you uh, start the service multiple times. So it's like that's why the heap dump here looks big and there's some uh, internal metadata uh, stored in this large uh, byte array. So it's like that's why you see here more objects and there's not much interesting from our service to see here because well, our service doesn't really uh, do much. Okay. I have a few questions to throw in. Um, so uh, one is, is an extra config when using this nav native image and microservice app where we're using Spring Cloud, uh, Spring Cloud config server files are accessed from a separate repo or is it best to use a native image in a Docker Compose? Uh, I'm not sure I understand uh, my whole question. Uh, I don't know what Spring Cloud config server files are. But it's like, uh, uh, maybe the generic answer to this question is like, uh, when you have a, a service that really needs configuration files, uh, then you have kind of uh, two possibilities. You can kind of uh, load your service configuration at build time, which kind of means that you already load everything, all the services configurations as early as possible. And then you start your application already kind of with a, uh, pre-computed uh, service and uh, when uh, you don't uh, when you want to have your service configured at runtime then of course you can do that too and it's like you kind of then build the generic thing that kind of loads your configuration file at uh, at runtime as long as you have all the necessary uh, code like for reflection registration uh, put in and then there's a question of will loom be supported by native image Loom is fully supported on native image. You can okay. use uh, as as of the last release. Of course, you need to be on uh, on the Java 19 release, and you need to uh, unlock the uh, uh, the uh, preview features because uh, Loom. Uh, so Loom is actually for the people who don't know it. Looms are virtual threads. Uh, so it's like the project to bring uh, virtual threads uh, to the JDK so that they can start millions of virtual threads uh, that then. Uh, 
have far less overhead than a real physical thread. And yeah, you can enable preview features on native image in the uh, in our Java 19 based release, and it works. And then there's is G1 supported in Community Edition. Uh, G1 is only available is only available in uh, the Oracle supported product, so it's like it's not in uh, it's not in the Community Edition. And then back to the Git repo that you showed earlier, I think just with Git, um, will that Git repo not become kind of huge after a while if it needs to continue metadata for all libs in all versions, or perhaps a uh, misunderstanding? Yes, yeah, but uh, cannot get bigger than the Git repository in which Microsoft maintains the Windows source code. So I, I think we have room. <laughs> so it's like, no, yes, it will grow. And uh, after a while, uh, of course, there will probably be kind of support for old versions of a library can be removed again. It's like if a version of a library is no longer supported, you can also remove uh, the library, uh, the, the native image support. But uh, so uh, for now, uh, we think that this repository will grow and the size is not going to be a problem. Also, it's like it's not containing much. It's containing this uh, resource configuration file. So it's not the kind of the biggest uh, thing. Oh yeah, we are nearly at the top of the hour, but it's like I have already kind of shown you uh, all of that. Uh, and yes, with our native build uh, tools plugins, it's like uh, you get uh, Gradle and Maven support, also JUnit support out of the box. So it's like JUnit has kind of, uh, some amount of uh, support code in to uh, support native images. One thing I want to talk about uh, performance again, just to mention it. Uh, of course, we don't kind of have a, a feedback-based optimizations because it's like, well, we don't know what really runs in your application. But what we have is like we have an instrumentation-based mode where you can build a, an image that is instrumented. The same way you can use a CCOM, uh, with GCC, you can build a GCC image that instruments and then gives you a profiling information. And then you can recompile your application with GCC to get a better binary. The same thing you can do with a native image. We also work in kind of a always on sampling based profiling. And then so it's like with a sampling based profiling and you get the samples in. You rebuild your native image with more precise uh, performance information and then you get the better optimized uh, binary. I already told you all the monitoring stuff. And since there were already enough uh, questions uh, about uh, Docker, it's like I already mentioned that, that is like, uh, when you have a native image, we have these two modes, uh, static native images and mostly static native images where you can then run with uh, very limited uh, Docker uh, configurations. So where you have very small uh, Docker images. And yeah, that's kind of uh, the end of my talk. Uh, in summary, what native image gives you is like a native binary out of your Java application that starts fast, has low resource usage, low resource usage and uh, uh, minimizes uh, security vulnerabilities and compact packaging. Uh, it is very easy to use by now because of all of the microservice frameworks, all the great work uh, that uh, the Spring people did uh, to integrate native image uh, in the build system, uh, make it very easy to use. Uh, the only thing is like you still need to be a little bit aware when you have things like reflection uh, that you need to do some things uh, manually at build time uh, that then you get uh, a native image that hopefully uh, helps you kind of reduce your uh, uh, your cloud uh, footprint and your costs that you uh, pay to cloud providers because you can run in smaller containers with uh, lower uh, use, uh, resource usages. Okay, are there any more questions before, before yes. we wrap up today? Um, they're asking if you could share some approximate numbers based on your experience so far, like how much faster startup time is, how much lower the memory consumption is, et cetera. Yeah, startup time is really great. As you saw, it's like, it's usually in the range of uh, uh, just dozens of milliseconds uh, for kind of even larger applications. And so it's like you always completely cut out the uh, seconds or so far that, that hotspot needs to start up. Then, but 
it does not help you, uh, just to make that clear, uh, when you have an application that itself at startup kind of reaches out to other services, does network accesses to loads configuration, we cannot help you with that, other than with the special mode that we give you that uh, kind of, you need to manually then configure your application to run as much as possible at build time. In terms of memory footprint, what you can uh, cut out is kind of uh, usually a couple of hundred megabytes uh, that uh, are just the static overhead of the Java hotspot VM. So it's like all the memory that the hotspot VM needs for maintaining class meter data, for the just-in-time compiler, for the JIT compiled code. Uh, also, one thing worth mentioning here is like uh, our objects are a little sl smaller. So it's like we have a smaller object header uh, than the Java hotspot VM. So it's like even at, uh, for your own Java objects, you might have a little bit of a memory footprint improvement. But if you allocate a 500 megabyte byte array, then of course you have a 500 megabyte byte array and there's nothing that we can do uh, about that. Okay, and then is it possible to add metadata for stuff from private Java modules, Jigsaw? Uh, private Java modules, it's like, uh, Whatever you put on the command line of the image generator uh, is in there. So it's like, it does not matter if your metadata is in Java modules, uh, in, in Java files, in a non-modularized application. It's like, from that point of view, it's like all the metadata, it's like we support the same command line as the Java uh, binary. So it's like the same options you can use on the Java. If your application runs with Java then and finds the metadata, then uh, it should also kind of find it in the native image generator. Questions, they're just comments, but Graal is awesome. And where was this 20 years ago? <laughs> well, 20 years ago, the interesting thing is like the time was not ready for it. It's like uh, the, the real uh, uh, benefit of uh, these small native images only came with microservices and and, and the cloud, because it's like uh, before 20 years ago, there would have been very little uh, benefit and very little incentive to do a system like that. And John says, this slide should add increased security, right? Uh, uh, yes, but uh, our legal team would never allow me to uh, say something like that. Okay. Awesome. And then a few, just a few more comments that people are saying our uh, desktop apps could benefit from small native images too, and cron jobs. Yes, yeah. And there is actually a very active community with kind of Pico CLI, for example, which is a, a command line uh, library for Java. And it's like that works quite well with native images. And it's like, yes, you can do command line applications. Uh, it's like it, it's another a pretty good use case. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, do you have any more things on your slides or no, screen share? Why not? I or should I pull that off? That I had to say. Thanks, everyone, uh, for attending. And I hope you try it out and give us feedback and file bugs on GitHub if there's anything that goes wrong. The great thing about open source, in addition to, well, one of the great things about open source. And so there's a few more things. Oh my gosh, like things are scrolling fast. Uh, Spring Shell 3.0 is pretty awesome too. Um, and then everyone, including myself, thanks to your talk. It's been awesome. So very nice, awesome session. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, yeah, a bunch of thank yous and everything. But yeah, thank you so much for doing this and coming on today. And for everyone who uh, either needs to watch this again. Um, if you missed it, I know someone that was commenting earlier, um, you can just go to the YouTube links if you're already on YouTube, for instance, and this is all posted online, or if you are you can see this later at any point that you want. It's basically gonna be there as soon as this stream ends to start from the beginning. So yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, thanks again, Christian, for uh, coming Thank on you, today and telling us about this. Mm -hmm. And so let's see.
there are a few things I just wanted to mention beforehand. So um, we have a Spring Academy. If you're trying to learn more stuff about Spring, uh, just go to spring.academy and there's some hands-on courses with like labs that you can go through and take and just learn more stuff. And I mentioned earlier um, that uh, Spring 1 this year is co-located with VMware Explorer. It is happening in person in August from August 21st through 24th for VMware Explorer, and it's in Vegas. Please submit your CFPs. The CFP is open, I believe, until the end of this month, so both for VMware Explorer and for Spring 1. So please get that in. And again, thank you, everyone, for coming today.